My name is Monk Rowe, and we are in Los Angeles filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. And I'm very, very pleased to have Joe Bushkin as my guest today, a fellow who's been around the world as well as to Hamilton College. Right. So, welcome. It's good to see you, Monk. Yeah. You know, I look at your, your list of people you've played with, and uh, I almost have to look at who you haven't played with as yeah, opposed to who you have. Yeah, I think that, that makes more sense. And <laughs> when you talk about who I haven't played with as a start, back in 1932, I was about 15 and a half and playing with a band at the Roseland Ballroom, Frank Lamar, and his stock arrangement orchestra, which drove me nuts. And uh, that's, 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 that started it all off. Actually, I. I was playing trumpet, and then I substituted for a piano player, mm. and then they stayed at the piano, as opposed to playing second trumpet under an out-of-tune trumpet lead oh. all night. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't take long for one to get tuned into their survival instinct. It starts with day one, as we know. Speaking of out-of-tune, you must have encountered a few pianos along the way oh, yeah. that were fairly out of tune. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, I became a roller coaster expert with the uh, Bergen Band and the Tommy Dorsey Band I was with. Uh, well, whenever we played all the ballrooms at the various amusement parks doing one-nighters, <laughs> uh, you know, if a piano was a half a tone off, at least I could transpose a little bit. But sometimes it was a quarter of a tone off, and then I must say Tommy was most pleasant about it. He said, "Take off, Joe. The roller coaster's waiting for you." You know, and, and I became a champ at that. <laughs> but uh, let's see, where were we? Well, how did you um, learn your piano skills? Were you mostly self-taught? No, I studied at the piano? Uh, when I was about nine or ten, I studied with a girl who lived up on the third floor of an apartment building we lived in, and uh, I, I enjoyed uh, the uh, 45 minutes or an hour once a week and learned to play the minuet in G like all the kids and mm -hmm. the scales or whatever. And, uh, and, and then uh, as a chap named Kosov, who was the owner of the building, and back in those days, it probably sound very strange to you, but I might as well continue, uh, where the, uh, the old guy would come around every week and collect his rent. It was the only way he was going to be sure he got it every week. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and the old guy wasn't feeling well or whatever. His son came around, and it turned out that his son had studied with Joseph Levine over in Paris or wherever. And, yeah, I guess it was Paris and uh, one of the great concert pianists. And I was, uh, I was in the other room uh, playing uh, the minuet in G, and he was curious about me, and he, he, he had me go in the kitchen, and he'd hit a note, and I'd tell him what note it was. He'd hit two notes, oh. and it was, uh, had perfect pitch. Had perfect I, pitch, huh? Yeah, which I wasn't aware of. <laughs> and uh, like all kids uh, of that particular age, I couldn't resist scooting around on a bicycle and getting both arms put in the cast, and that started the trumpet playing, of course, I and switched over. But anyway, uh, that was a start, and I got to tell you, when I think of what's going on in our world in the 90s economically, uh, we were happy to get $3 a night for playing uh, a Polish paper hanger ball or something, you know, <laughs> wallpaper well, hanger. How did your folks feel about your progression into music and when it looked oh, no, like it was going to be a career? They were wonderful with me, yeah. and uh, my dad was, uh, was, you know, we lived in the most patriarch society you can possibly imagine, which would take a great imagination to come up with back in those days, you know. Uh, I was 82 years old this last year, so I, I'm talking about 70 years ago, and uh, my, uh, my, and uh, my dad was very, very musically inclined, and he just, you know, and he just loved the idea of me doing music. My brother studied violin, but he, he, he wound up playing in the NYU Symphony Orchestra or whatever when he was mm -hmm. going to college, and uh, he, he was not 
uh, he wasn't uh, lucky, I'd say, to be born with a natural talent, you know, period. You mentioned playing stock arrangements with that, yeah. that yeah, first that band. band the, yeah. These were things that just could be purchased by any band. Right. They weren't specifically written for that particular Right, band. exactly. They, just, they were always written for, uh, I believe, five brass and four saxophones in a rhythm section. Mm -hmm. you know? And they were uh, the tunes that were coming out on Broadway or films and so forth, you know. In any case, uh, nowadays the, the, the kids get a terrific break because uh, actually if, uh, if a guy has a band, he's in a position to buy uh, Billy Mays arrangements and Billy Byers and all yeah. the best Cy Oliver and the great writers. I mean, yeah, all of the great arrangements that they did are available, you know. And uh, if you're with the right band, you'll be playing those kind of arrangements. And you played mostly for dancing at, at these bars. Yeah, it was yeah, back in the 30s, the early 30s, yeah. and and into the swing era. And uh, I played intermission piano at Kelly's Stables with Coleman Hawkins Quartet. You know, was there, and then I was at the Embers. I could go on for yeah. endlessly. Uh, where uh, we opened, we opened the Embers in New York, which became the hot jazz uh, venue, and uh, we were there for nine weeks. And believe it or not, I was there with uh, Mill Hinton, Buck Clayton, Joe Jones on drums. That was the quartet. Wow! And Art Tatum was, you know, there appearing. Did you guys? Play one yeah, set back. Right. We just spelled one another, uh -huh. and uh, it was hard work actually because you play four or five shows a night, you know, from 9:30 to four in the morning. Wow. And as many times, Art would call me and ask me to do his first set for him, you know, because he wasn't <laughs> feeling up to it. And I'd be happy to do it, you know, when you're a young cat and you got a lot of energy and. And also a great love for what I was doing, which was the biggest break of all. Yeah. You know, uh, the percentage of people in the world who go to work every day and really love what they do is very, very small. I can't even think of it mathematically. It's right. way down there, you know. You made a statement about, uh, I think, about Art Tatum, that he was a surgeon, yeah. what he did. I guess so, yeah. I was in a different racket. I was a lawyer and he was a surgeon. <laughs> I couldn't, uh, whereas Johnny Smith uh, played with us for a few weeks at a time. He's on one of the CDs that you have here on the, the, uh, the Road to Oslo with Bing Crosby mm -hmm. to Anaya Jazz and, and Johnny Smith, Jake Hanna, and Mill Hinton. Uh, and myself, we were with Bing on tour and we just loved being with him. We were never presented more beautifully, and uh, we, hmm. he just was a jazz uh, aficionado. And uh, oh, I've done a couple of things for the Sinatra at Hofstra University. You know, that's all been going on. Right. And uh, I was with Tommy Dorsey's band when Frank was a boy singer for about two years. And I love Frank. I was saying one of the things he missed with the Dorsey band was my piano playing. Mm. And that was a great compliment. And then uh, Frank recorded uh, some material for me. In fact, he got hot time in the town of Berlin over to Bing when there was a musician strike on for about two years. I don't know, you might not recall That's that. Right. That's right. The you know, musicians union and, wouldn't yeah, allow you know, any recording. Right, in 43 or whatever, 42, mm -hmm. 43. I was a band leader in Douglas, Arizona in the Air Corps. And uh, I was up in L.A. picking up some uh, dance band equipment, which the government, it wasn't GI equipment, obviously. And I'd pick up some mutes and derbies and some dance band stands for my jazz band. And uh, amongst the 45, 50 musicians we had in the military band, it was a, uh, it was uh, the 410th Air Corps band, and uh, it was in Douglas, Arizona, and they built a a, a brand new airfield for uh, for P-38 pilots who trained in uh, A-20s, which was a, a two-seater with the exact confirmation of a P-38. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, when you think about it, they were graduating maybe five or 6,000 cadets every six, seven weeks. Wow. And, and these were young, young fellows, right? All young right fellows. Right out of high school. Yeah. And right. And all being sent out on a, there sure was a world war on at the time. Yeah. I didn't, don't even realize that there were some other wars that went on, Korean and Vietnam, you know. Yeah. Guys talk about being in the Army later on, I wonder. Uh, somehow or other, when you're not in the service, you don't think about it. Yeah. Same old story. You got sent overseas yourself, right? Yeah, well, I was over on the Marianas, and, uh, uh, you know, I was, uh, when I was at Douglas, uh, I ran the Dave Rose, who was the musical director for a new show, which was going to be called Wing Victory, that Morris Hart wrote, and uh, Swifty Lazar, the agent, he was a captain in the show in the Air Corps, and uh, I was delighted to be uh, uh, an assistant conductor to Dave, and I'd conduct this big 80-piece orchestra or whatever on a Wednesday matinee and a Saturday. That was easy because uh, Dave had already straightened it out, and I figured out very early in life in order to get the attention of that many men, slow it down occasionally and go a little faster occasionally, otherwise they're not going to even look up, you know. <laughs> The good same old point. story. Yeah, that's a very good point. Oh, absolutely. You have to, you have to let them know that you're up there. <laughs> oh, oh, for sure. And uh, amongst the technical musicians, it's not, it's a far cry from uh, the jazz field. You know, uh -huh. we just ran into Bill Berry down in, in the lobby of the hotel. I got such a kick out of seeing Bill. And, yeah. And he's talking about Robert Flake being a jazz fan. I met him when I was in town. He said he's sorry he missed me, you know, coming in uh, to hear Ross Tompkins and at a place called Chadney's or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are so few jazz saloons that make any sense these days. It's a lost art in yeah. its own way. Um, overseas, you ran into oh, a yeah. couple of fellow Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we wound up... Uh, on Iwo Jima, and then Saipan, Tinian, and then, uh, and then the war was still on. I was in Guam, and they ran out of uh, cots for the boys. You know, we were sleeping on the ground on, you know, in a tent on a GI blanket. And I was walking down the road, and I ran to Joe Anderson, who was involved with Hamilton College. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the time, he was a captain of the Marine Corps. And he was a provost marshal of the island. He was in charge of all of the native, so-called, you know, uh, uh, police, and uh, had nothing to do with uh, with MPs or you know or, or military police. It I see. Had to do with the police in charge of the natives, which couldn't have been that easy. They were all in a panic, you know. They were dropping bombs on these guys. And uh, I, I went up staying with Joe. He had the, some of his native police build a, a tent with some wooden sides and a good canvas top. And they built some two by fours, made beds out of them by using the inner tubes of B-29s that were no longer useful <laughs> and cutting them into about two inch strips and nailing it down, you know, like, you know, crisscross on the two by fours with Coca-Cola caps so they don't <laughs> split. And it was the most comfortable bed I ever slept in in my life. You Talk know. about improvising, eh? Oh, yeah. I mean, they were, they were like jazz musicians. <laughs> and uh, that was a good rhythm section that built those beds, I'll tell you that. But anyway, I was delighted to see Joe. And we, of course, talked about Ernie Anderson, who was way, way back, way before Norman Grant's and Jazz at the Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. He did all our NBC Eddie Condon TV shows when there it was a great idea for a program, but they needed people to own TV sets to see it, which is not the way it was. Mm -hmm. But he always had Lips Page, Louis Armstrong, Jack T. Garden, Peanuts Hucko, and George Wetling, and myself, and, and uh, uh, it was some wonderful, wonderful and music and yeah. one of the things that makes you realize that there's a big difference in playing a, a program live and recording it which which companies never did often enough 
And when you get in the studio, that's a whole nother yeah. sound. Well, Ernie was very passionate about the music, wasn't he? he oh, was just very. A he, he was just writing. terrific. Yeah. Oh, we we uh, we hung out many, many, many years later, and over the years, and we were getting a theater in England together. I mean, he he turned up uh, to be John Huston's right hand man. So I got to know John and hang out with Ernie and John at his castle in Ireland, near Galway, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, so I stayed with Joe. He, they had an extra bed, and he had a, there was a, a Marine major about my size. I would casually put his Marine major uniform on and go and have food at the Marine mess hall. Oh, just casual. Instead of the kind of food we were getting, and they had the best food. Uh, in any case, uh, the, there was a two-star general marine who n knew what I did, knew who I was, and you know didn't make any scene about it. He said, "I'm which is great having you to dinner or something." You know? <laughs> and I don't. I played a couple of uh, little cocktail parties for him in a Quonset hut, and he was delighted. But anyway, that goes back a ways, yeah. and uh, I, I love Joe and and. Uh, uh, in fact, I played it at Hamilton for yes, Joe's did. going away party, yes, I believe it was. That's true. He was, uh, he was retiring and, uh, uh, well, you can explain what Joe did at the college. He was a fundraiser, I believe. Yes, and he very much, uh, uh, communications and development. Yeah. And he's a, a, you know, very important uh, figure in the, in the history of the college, actually. Yeah, so. well, I'm sure he had a full professorship going, at least, you know. Yeah. Um, did you ever have any inkling that you were not going to make a career in music? That, that you was, might do something else? Was there any question in your mind from the time you were? Uh, no, I was. I was really kind of stuck with it. Mm -hmm. It's you, a little pressure that goes on when you have uh, a natural talent, you know, because uh, you got to live up to it and and uh, really produce and be creative when you're called upon. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many days, you know, you, they talk about the right place at the right time. That doesn't happen as often as uh, playing a gig, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and as a matter of fact, you learn, uh, I don't know how to put this, but you learn from your failures and you don't learn from your successes, you know. Yeah. And once you listen to a tape or an old 78 or a vinyl, you say, no, I could have done this better or that better. As a matter of fact, I think it's interesting from a jazz point of view, when I did the Louis Armstrong, Benny Goodman tour, uh, and I played with Louis, as, as Louis put it, we were walking in the rain one afternoon and and he kind of looked over at me and he said, you, you're with the right Benny. You, you got the right Benny on, meaning in that kind of language, uh, a Benny is a, a raincoat. And because the fact that I was with Benny's band after the war for a year, 10 months or whatever it was, and wrote a bunch of things for him, which we recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, Ernie, uh, well, I was delighted to be with Louie. I was a happy, uh, you know, a quintet. Yeah. It was really fun. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm no. going to play something that... Uh, sure. It dates back... I found a country and I believe this is from 1953. When we discovered romance like we never knew. What tune is this? This is April in Portugal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that goes back a ways. Yeah, well, I tell you, Louis Armstrong. I, I, I like the fact that Winton Marcellus talks about Louis all the time. Yeah. And I appreciate that. That makes me listen to him a little more carefully. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Louis was the messiah of our music. There's no two ways about it. And, uh, you know, it's, 
I don't know how to put this except uh, Louis was like a great, great obstetrician who delivered a, a thousand kids but didn't have any of his own, you know. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good way to put it. That's it for sure. Yeah. yeah. He really and uh, what Louis did, I meant to mention, is that when I did the uh, Armstrong Goodman concert with him, he always had a little wall in sock, and he would record every one of our performances. And uh, with all the static and, you know, just done off the cuff, he'd throw a mic on the floor someplace backstage. <laughs> and uh, I asked him about it, and he was uh, writing his autobiography and playing the tapes, you know, the next night, whatever. And I always dress in, in uh, Louis's dressing room. He insisted on me doing that. And that was great for me. Mm. And I got a chance to really, uh, you know, I've always loved Louis, and, and uh, we, we had a great rapport. And uh, he was listening, and, uh, and I remember him listening to uh, the Saints go marching in, which was the finale. And one evening he played ba do 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 and he liked that phrase so he kept it in from then on. So Louis was a stickler for for listening to himself and finding riffs that he liked and avoiding the ones he thought were not as happy or didn't sound like him as much as he wanted it to. So he was truly a gifted artist, of will we, yeah. we all know that. He would take uh, something that was improvised and listen back to it and say, hey, that's a great lick. Yeah. I'm going to keep that as part of my... A part of the my, improvisation, my, yeah, right. Yeah. When people Very talk about improvising music, uh, you've got to know the tune to begin with, you know. And uh, after you've played it a number of times, and then it's fun to improvise on what you originally played. Mm -hmm. And you find all kinds of better things to insert. And sometimes you don't, so you go back to what you originally played. You know, you've got a cop out. You're learning from your mistakes, as, as if you said yeah, before. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. You, you, you learn from that. Yeah. And you don't ever learn from any success as, as much, you know. Uh -huh. But I must say that that changes that whole phraseology because if you had a good successful concert you do learn some riffs that you should repeat the next mm -hmm. time around. Yeah. Yeah, you, well, really, you learn from every move. Yeah. Was Joe Glazer um, managing Louis? Really? Oh yeah, at the time. When and you were with him fact, too. Uh, I mean, Ernie did a lot of stuff for Joe. Mm-hmm. And when I was at the embassy, I had Joe represent me. I hardly needed any representation to be playing nine weeks in a row with a quartet. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I came back and played 26 weeks on 54th Street, opposite El Morocco, between uh, Lex and Third. And uh, we were always jammed with people. And there was another reason for it, oddly, the economics of what one does keeps sneaking up on you. For example, uh, there was a, a war tax a after World War II, which went on until uh, until the middle 50s someplace, you know, about uh -huh. 53. So that went on for a good, uh, the war was over 45 in August, that went on uh, about seven, eight years. And there was a 20% tax on your bill if there was dancing or a stand-up comic, any dialogue, or any singing. And that would be considered a show then. You mean for the audience, if, if, if their bill was 20 bucks, there was a 20% tax on that, on top of as, that as the war tax. Right. Yeah. But there was, there was no tax for instrumental groups. Oh. So if a guy showed up with a party of six or eight and racked up a tab for a C note or whatever, uh, that $20 took care of the waiter's tip and the cab ride. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did a, a lot of business based on the fact that during the 26-week uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
seen. We had Red Norvo's trio and my group, you know. Well, I was there for the whole, for the whole 26 weeks and uh, whatever you want to call it. I was considered uh, the draw in the place. Uh -huh. And then we had Teddy Wilson in the group and actually there was a second floor to the famous door. No, oh, this is another time. This is way before that. But um, and, but at the Embers, we did have uh, uh, Roy Eldridge in the group and Teddy Wilson in the group, and Red Norvo. So uh, there was always a lot of great music. And uh, the, the wonderful thing I loved about my group with Buck Clayton Milk you know, Hinton and uh, Joe Jones, uh, who's a fantastic artist on the percussion, that if uh, we didn't sound on a Tuesday night like we thought we should, I could go out and hawk everything I owned and bet that the first set on Wednesday would be great. Uh-huh. Because we all would sleep on it, you know. No kidding. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, in other words, Buck was such a great player, and he would never let himself down. And there were times when things happened off the gig and uh, at home mm -hmm. and with some little kids running around keeping you awake when you should be getting some rest. Uh, you, you show up kind of beat up, and that's what it's all about, yeah. really. Can you recall where you were the day that uh, war ended in Japan. That what? The, where were you the day the war ended in Japan? Oh, I was, uh, uh, I was on Guam, actually. And uh, there were six or seven of us, uh, Peter Lynn Hayes and a few other guys who were uh, involved in the Wing Victory show. Because when David Rose left Wing Victory, I became musical director of it, so I was conducting every night. When the show broke up, we all wound up, and uh, well, not all of us, but uh, Pete Lynn Hayes and uh, Larry Adler, the harmonica player's brother, Jerry Adler, who played harmonica. That was a great joy. But we, we, we wound up uh, uh, playing shows on aircraft carriers and... Uh, uh, all through the Mariana Islands. Mm -hmm. and so we were on Iwo Jima, and we, uh, there was an experience on Iwo Jima where we had papers to, uh, to get to Saipan, and being on the airfield two or three mornings in a row, we couldn't get a ride. And we had uh, our orders uh, to be up at Saipan, and uh, we were having some chow, and on the chow line, of all people to be there, there was Tyrone Powell, who was the second, who was the first Louis, I believe, and he was a flyer for a marine uh, cargo plane. Mm -hmm. And Peter Lynn Hayes went up to him and said, uh, "You did a film with my wife Mary Healy, and and uh, explained we were trying to get to Saipan." He said, "That's where I'm headed. If you don't mind sitting on the floor of the plane, we don't have any seats." He said, we'll be there. Well, the next morning, we were off with, with uh, you know, power. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a perfect um, GI. He had a couple of bottles of scotch stashed in a duffel bag. And, and then of all guys to meet, another captain in the Marine Corps was uh, the guy that wrote Route 66. Uh, you know, the Bobby, Bobby Troop. Troop. Right. And he was in charge of, uh, of the black troops, which were the service group, mm -hmm. you know. They would straighten the planes out and load them up with whatever bombs. I remember being on Tinian when the Seabees left and a new group came in and took over their barracks and they had a wonderful mess hall fixed up, you know, because the Seabees were doing all the building. And uh, usually the outfit that was on an island the longest would replace the Seabees as a camp. Mm -hmm. They would get their camp. But there was a whole new outfit, and there were a bunch of guys. And that was the uh, Colonel Tippett and the Alona Gay and mm -hmm. with the uh, atomic bomb on it. And uh, I got to tell you, the GIs with that outfit had no idea they had an atomic bomb. Oh. They were just simply told they had a very strong... Just doing their job. The yeah. Right. So was cool. was the end of the war a surprise, or was it 
Yeah, Everyone it was felt quite it was, a surprise yeah. because we were uh, we were in the uh, trans and flyers barracks, and uh, the MPs drove up and around three or four in the morning and said, "Hey guys, the war is over," and I had stashed a half a gallon of pure alcohol, which I got from an aircraft carrier, which you could mix with a little cans of grapefruit juice, and I mixed a drink for us. And the next move is I went over and started to choke an accordion player until I could kill him. <laughs> it took four or five guys to get me off of him. <laughs> you were fond of accordions? The guy who played the accordion on the show that Peter and Hayes put together, who was terrible. <laughs> He couldn't get through Melancholy Baby. I used to play the trumpet with one hand and the keyboard with my left hand and play the right chord. Oh, it was something similar to the right so chord. So figured now that the war's over, I can let this guy have it. <laughs> oh, I, can, I gotta get rid of him. And uh, sure enough, uh, the war was back on. Uh, the emperor had uh, reneged and uh, so it was on for another 24 hours. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, there were two, uh, it was a false alarm, and then oh. the next night, it was definitely over the next mm. morning. And um, I must say that Emperor Hirohito showed uh, a great amount of, um, whatever one would call it, uh, unlike our President Clinton, mm -hmm. he was a great leader where he informed, don't forget, we were dealing with a dictatorship. There was a complete control on the radio, on Radio Tokyo and the newspapers and so forth, and the media. And the emperor made uh, a point of announcing to the Japanese people that uh, they hadn't lost the war. An agreement was made with the Allies and to treat the American GIs like they wanted the uh, the Japanese soldiers to be treated in America and England and so forth. And I never did hear of uh, whatever they call those chaps, the rednecks from Oklahoma who were snagging little Japanese girls off the street, you know, mm -hmm. carrying them in the corners and over to the railroad station where the coal was stashed in between, uh, you know, setups. Uh -huh and carrying on, but uh, there was never a, a rough up. As a matter of fact, I did a 15 minute piano program. It was actually about 11 minutes, you know, with a dialogue and for, uh, for the army, you know, and uh, they had the, uh, how I found out about the emperor's move was through uh, the Japanese symphony orchestra in the next studio at Radio Tokyo. Oh. And there were a couple of German French horn players who spoke English who actually went to school in America. And they, they're the ones, uh, I said I was, a, I was surprised at not hearing of any rough ups. And they explained that to me. I see. And I got a lot of little postcards from different ships in the area and various GIs asking for Sweet Lorraine and different tunes that uh -huh. they wanted to hear. And it was a piano program. I was uh, kind of the poor man's Uncle Don at the, of Radio Tokyo at the time. Oh. And they actually uh, gave me a Jeep to get from an insurance building where we were all staying. And I'm not very handy uh, with tools, but I had to remove the carburetor when I parked the Jeep, otherwise it would be stolen. Oh, no kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but those are all, I could go on for That's nine cool. days with <laughs> more experience. Let more. me ask you about a couple um, recordings. And I, if my information is correct, in 1936, you recorded with Billy Holiday? Yeah, uh, Billy's Blues, Summertime, and mm -hmm. no that, regrets. Yeah, that became a classic, yeah. you know, 78. She was just, um, wh well, where was her career at that point? Was she well known? No, she was uh, singing and carrying on at a saloon up in Harlem, mm -hmm. you know, as uh, one of the young, good-looking black gals that the audience would dig. Mm -hmm. And Bernie Hannigan, who wrote As Long As I Live and a bunch of other good tunes with Johnny Mercer, was a big fan of uh, Bunny Bergen's and Artie Shaw, myself and included. Uh, and uh, he's the one that uh, 
he was uh, a, he was an A and R man, or you know, uh, a repertoire artist, you know, director of Vocalion Records, mm -hmm. and uh, not John Hammond, but Bernie Hannigan was the first guy to record, you know, Billy Holiday. And I went down to uh, to Bernie's little pad in Greenwich Village, and I had a whole stack of uh, lead sheets from motion picture themes and various songs that the publishers were publishing at the time. That whole business has done a complete 180 turn where the Beatles, I must give them credit for the fact that they published their own music. Because mm -hmm. once they made a hit, no one else was going to make it. But that's not what went on in the music business at the time. They had the Jimmy Dorsey band, Woody Herman, Benny Goodman, you know, all of the different bands who were recording for various companies. And that was the reason to have a publisher, but I must say, uh, like all mortgage brokers and bankers, they had 50% of the action. Oh. Whereas the lyricist got 25% and the composer got 25%. So the publishers were making out pretty well. Oh, they were doing great. Yeah. And they had some very low-paying professional men running around delivering, you know, the lead sheets. Trying to get the bands to record yeah, their right. songs. Yeah, right, and then the publishers might come up with a case of scotch or some, oh. uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, I guess, a payola, yeah. you know, of that time. Did you find Billy Holiday um, different or a little difficult to play with? Because, she, you know, she oftentimes would sing pretty far behind the beat yeah. No, I didn't find that to be true at all. As a matter of fact, uh, she showed up at Bernie Hannigan's in a, in a house coat with some egg stains on it and not put together at all. And the minute she started to sing, she looked very beautiful. Oh. That happens all the time, of mm -hmm. course. Like, for example, when I was over in London, I was with Ernie Anderson, uh, getting a theater together and so forth. and. Uh, a guy named Jerome White, Jerry White, he worked for the uh, Rogers and Hammerstein people. And uh, he was uh, a master sergeant like myself as a stage manager for Wing Victory. And when he found out I was in town, he gave a party for me at, uh, yeah, on the roof or whatever, uh, big, uh, uh, you know, banquet room for the uh, Porgy and Bess. Uh, cast and uh, whatever was going on at the time in in London that he was in charge of. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just really delighted to see Cab Calloway and um, some wonderful guys. And I had Bill Bailey was a dancer at the show and he's Pearl Bailey's brother. Oh. Who I had worked with at the Southland in Boston when I was with Bunny Bergen's band. And then Leotine Price said, uh, she was going to sing, and she wanted to sing Summertime. And I said, what's, you know, what's your range? What key do you do it? And she said, the entire keyboard. And play it whatever key is comfortable <laughs> for you. And there's another case of the minute she laid her pipes on you, she looked beautiful. You know? Wow. But she was so great, I never forgot it. You know, she could uh -huh. sing anything. Right. Well, you did some singing yourself. Over the years? Yeah, I sang on my, uh, when I was at Bing, and did a, a CD for the Norwegian Red Cross, mm -hmm. which you have a copy of. Uh, mm -hmm. Bing was signed with, with Polygram at the time, and they had a deal arranged with United Artists. So Bing said, why don't you do it? And he could sing, uh, and now he has jazz to start the, the LP. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote a corny lyric to a public domain tune that he called Sail Away from Norway as a closing yeah. tune on that for the Norwegian Red Cross. So oh. they took care of the boys, and uh, I went into the United Auto Studio and did it. You know, there was mm -hmm. no big panic about it. And I was thrilled to have Johnny Smith uh, was playing I Love, and was a great, great guy, and Jake Hanna and, and Milt. We just went ahead and did it. You know? wow. When did you first start to compose? Oh, I don't know. 
automatically playing the piano and improvising, you're composing to start with, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a situation uh, that you might get a kick out of. Uh, Sinatra was the boy singer. They had Connie Haynes with the group and the Pied Pipers. And I was really delighted to be with the Dorsey Band because you got a nine-foot coffin in front of you. And in any other band, you're out there alone. It's not like being one of the trumpet players with uh, a cohort on either side of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, when we were playing the Astor Roof back in 1940, um, if some uh, exuberant female start pulling her dress up above her earlobes or whatever on the dance floor, you know, carrying on, I always had Sinatra sitting right by the piano to tap me on the shoulder and not look at the lead sheet, you know, not look at the arrangement. Check that Check arrangement out. <laughs> so I had that, that was fun for me. And I really uh, loved being around the Pied Pipers and Joe Stafford and, uh -huh. and uh, whatever. We were doing a program called Fame and Fortune. Oddly enough, uh, it was the Nature's Remedy Company. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, and uh, they made uh, a laxative for older people and Tums, you know, and uh, here they were, uh, they booked the Tommy Dorsey band, uh, which appealed to the youth. So that <laughs> made a lot of sense. to you by nature's laxative, huh? Huh? That's funny. Yeah. And uh, every week we'd get a stack of tunes, because the winning tune would be the close number of the half hour show and it would always be done with the Pied Pipers and Connie Haynes and Sinatra and make a big production out of it and you couldn't look for any musical talent there except if you can run into a lyric that made any sense at all Cy Oliver and Max Ristortle, Paul Weston, we had three great arrangers and myself could sketch out uh, a production number mm -hmm. and make it sound good and uh, Tommy Dorsey, in his most generous fashion, as we call him, the laughing Irishman, uh, the uh, big prize on the program was a $100 war bond and, uh, or a $100 government bond at the time, and uh, that the Tommy Dorsey BMI publishing company would be publishing the song that was chosen. I see. So, how did they decide who the winner was? Well, no, it was just, uh, uh, oh, uh, by uh, mail that came in on the I tunes see. and a reaction from uh, people, I guess you might call it a poll taken mm -hmm. in some sense. Uh, yeah, that's how they decided yeah. on it. And uh, we got out to uh, the West Coast and opened the, uh, the Hollywood Palladium the Dorsey band did, and uh, somehow or other Tommy's music company uh, didn't forward the music for the uh, Fame and Fortune program, which was oh. like, this was on a Wednesday, and the program was Thursday, you know, maybe it was a Tuesday and a Wednesday, we were at the, at the, uh, at the L.A. Uh, Paramount, I think it was called the Philharmonic at the time, and doing uh, a film and a and a uh, swing band uh, stage show in between each film. And uh, we were looking for a tune, and it hadn't arrived. And uh, I had uh, written a tune. I, I had written a couple of tunes for the Pied Pipers, because they, they had very few arrangements for, for the Pipers with the band. Oh. And uh, Tommy was never there for the first set, and he'd leave for the last set. He'd come in and do a set for dancing and a show and so forth. And uh, Bunny Bergen was with the band when I joined Tommy's band. And mm -hmm. Bunny would always call, oh, look at me now. And Sinatra would, how do you do without me, which I, with two tunes I had written at the mm -hmm. time for them, uh, during the first set. And uh, people would dance by and ask Tommy for, oh, look at me now. He said, we don't have that, you know, because he had no idea we had it. Oh. And so Cy uh, or Axel Stardle went up to Tommy and said, why don't we use one of Joe's tunes? And 
not put my name on it because you know if you were part of the uh, the band, you weren't allowed to submit a tune for a winner on the program I and see. so forth. Same old. And uh, so they just put Johnny DeVries' name on it. Then later on, when all the other people recorded it, they had my name on mm -hmm. the record. And uh, I managed to get it away from Tommy uh, to put in ASCAP when I joined ASCAP. And I was writing a whole lot of stuff. I started to write a show with DeVries, and I was very happy writing with him. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, that got the most mail. So we recorded it with another tune. Of, Tommy made it the B-side to keep the, the noise down. And that turned out to be a standard hit, wow. as it turns out. And what happened is I wrote it for the Pipers, and it was easy enough to put Sinatra into it and, the, and Connie Haynes. And so that became an ad lib. We did it the very same night. Wow. We chose it that afternoon, and that night we did the Fame and Fortune program. And uh, Cy Oliver and Axel Stordle with some uh, strips of music, uh, five lines, you know, to change a, a riff here and there uh -huh. in order to match up all the singers doing it and so forth and make a production out of it and then yeah. and all that. Wow. And that's how that happened. And uh, actually, I started to tell you that during the war, when I was a band leader in Douglas, I, I was in town and ran into Frank at the uh, Brown Derby and he invited me back to the Huntington Hartford Theater where they were doing the Old Gold program. And he said, Jesus, a lot of cats who were in Tommy's band are with the studio band, you know, they'd love to hang out with him. And also the fact that you couldn't get a drink if you were in uniform until 5 p.m. And this was around lunchtime. He said, I've got a bar set up in my dressing room. You can carry on. And he said, have you been writing any tunes? And I said, well, some marches and so forth. Yeah. I did Hot Time in the Town of Berlin. He said, I can't record it because we can't use musicians. But Bing has a retroactive deal with the union. Oh. And I know he's recording next week. And so he said his company, Frank's company, would publish it and, and get it to Bing. And then later on, I talked to Bing. And Bing said, I saw your name on it. And John, Master Sergeant Joe Bushkin, PFC Johnny, or Corporal Johnny DeVries, he said, I knew you could use a few extra bucks with the kind of loot you were getting from the government, from that band. And so I was going to record it. I didn't even know what it went like. And it I turned see. out to be a hit as, it, as well, things would happen. He, you said he had a, some kind of deal with the union. He could record? With musicians. And so he and the Andrews sisters and the band, Vic Schoen was the arranger then for the Andrews sisters, and he could use musicians because Bing owned half a Decca. Oh. So he was able to say, you've got half of uh, the royalty on any of the records I see. for the musician's pension fund. Oh. That's what it was all about. Okay. And the other companies were backing off because they kept insisting, look, we only pay our men $30 for a three-hour session, and we're not paying any royalty to the union. Mm -hmm. So they try mm -hmm. to beat the rap. Yeah. I guess that was a good thing in the end, but there was a lot of music that was lost during oh, those two sure. years yeah. that never got on Yeah, the like there were a lot of three-point baskets not thrown by the NBA with their strike. That's true. The same old. It yeah. keeps going. It'll go on forever. Good analogy. I'm not concerned about that. I have no feeling about longevity because uh -huh. everything seems to be the same anyway. Uh-huh. Did the... You witnessed some of the changes in the segregation between the, the blacks and whites in, in music? Well, uh, let's see. In Benny's band, as you know, uh, Lionel Hampton and, uh, I don't know, uh, in 1951, uh, I opened the embers, and I had Buck Clayton. Uh, oddly enough, I had three black guys with me, mm -hmm. Bill Hinton, Buck Clayton, and Joe Jones. Later on, Johnny Smith, uh, Buck had to do some stuff with Count Basie again, and Johnny Smith came in and played with us, so they were, we were split equally, mm -hmm. two whites and two colored. And uh, as a young, you know, as, as a young kid, or going to school, 
there was always a, a deep segregation. And as a matter of fact, the thing that Mill Hinton was telling me that uh, he was the first concert bassist with the Northwestern Symphony Orchestra, and the uh, Chicago Symphony needed bass players. And he was not invited to audition because there were no blacks mm -hmm. in symphony orchestras at that point. It's hard to believe, but that's what's happening. Right. right. And it's going to take another 100 years or two for it to straighten itself out. I'm yes. Sure. You were on the involved in one of Bing Crosby's last recordings, too, weren't you? Mm -hmm. It's around 76 or so. Yeah, back in 77, actually, when we mm -hmm. did uh, the Norwegian. So that was one of the last ones, yeah. yeah. On, I mean, under my label, mm -hmm. under my name, whatever. And Bing sang Now He Has Jazz and the Sail Away From Norway. That's really the last, last commercial record he ever did. Right. As a matter of fact, when you talk about the segregation of black musicians and white musicians back then, it didn't seem to matter if a guy was blue, black, yellow, or green, if he sounded great, played like Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. I he guess was so. Whiter than white. Yeah. <laughs> I have another selection here uh, that goes back a ways. It's really a, a, a different style. I'm, I'm curious about um, why this particular kind of music was being done at the time. I think you probably recognize this. Is that a record of mine? Yes. Uh, listen to the choir? Yes. Yeah. Lord, uh, uh -huh. Lord choir. Yeah, well, that's uh, Ray Conniff, who was in Bunny Bergen's band. Mm -hmm. We were together. And uh, he did some choral with records uh, for, for Columbia, for Mitch Millen. They seemed to catch on, and, and Capital wanted me to do, uh, me to use a choral group with the uh -huh. piano. That's, that's how that came about. And, and this was around what year? Do you remember? I have the record here. Yeah, around uh, about 55, uh -huh. like that, 54, 55. Yeah. There seemed to be a whole kind of a uh, lot of instrumental music e popular even into the 50s. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the first uh, the first uh, LP I did for Capitol, there was a, a wonderful man. His name was A. Berman. And he represented Harold Allen, Johnny Mercer, Vincent Newman, uh, Yip Harburg. I can go on almost forever. And he was a wonderful, wonderful old guy. And, and uh, he knew I was at the Embers and doing well. And I, I, I made some records for Columbia with the quartet. And you probably know about those records. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking to Abe about, well, he sold Capitol Records for, for Johnny Mercer and Buddy De Silva to EMI, uh, the electric musical industries in you know, in London. And uh, obviously, being the attorney making the deal, he knew their kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And back then, as you know, Art Tatum or Teddy Wilson, it didn't matter who it was, a jazz re a recording, if it sold 25,000 LPs, uh, it was like a July 4th celebration, <laughs> you know? And I just uh, talked to Abe about it. I said, you know, the idea is to get to uh, the wider public and play some ballads or whatever. So he had an idea, and he talked to me, and he, he talked to the to the company. And the deal he got for me was that he w uh, that I would uh, record a mood album with piano, and I was going to use strings and orchestra. And uh, if I sold fifty thousand within six months, they would then be obligated to pick up a three-year contract of three LPs a year, uh, and I'd be allowed to uh, use the same amount of men that I paid for on the first LP. Nice. So 
So I was able to use all kinds of different instrumentation. Later on with Ken Hopkins, we worked on a Blue Angels LP with eight trombones, you know, for stereo, uh -huh. with four on each speaker, which an engineer screwed up by putting it all together, of course. Oh, but dear. Uh, that's the way the yeah. thinking was at the time. But what I did was, after doing the LP, I was in a position to pay for it at the time, and also I was in a position to go off on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, I was staying in Palm Springs at the time with the family, and uh, I started uh, a tour up in Boston in February in the middle of a snowstorm. And back in those days, there was a whole different approach to um, marketing, uh, to to marketing recordings. Mm -hmm. Every company had their own professional manager in every major city, including Hartford and New Haven, etc. Uh, uh, and that manager would hire two or three salesmen to go around with the recordings and go to the department stores and little record shops or ground phone shops or whatever. Yeah. And uh, they'd get some action for you. And the way to get that going was simply to show up and do a disc jockey tour in each oh. town. Uh -huh. So I never did go to bed to speak of for about, oh, 20 cities in a row. You know, I, I really, oh, I think it was 26. Wow. And uh, by the time I got to Chicago from Boston, uh, I went by Marshall Field and wanted to get a few LPs. And they said, we have orders for about a dozen of them. And they didn't know who I was. And uh -huh. we, can, we can put you on a waiting list. I couldn't understand that. And I called A. Berman. And as it turned out, Mike Maitland, who later went with reprise and all that, he was uh, supposed to, uh, he and a chap named Bud Fraser, were in charge of making sure that there were enough LPs that were going to be sold. And the deal that A. Berman had organized for me was that I would sell 50,000 in six months, and they only pressed 25,000. So that, oh, that's, brother. so I, Abe called Glenn Wallach, who was in charge of the he had been in charge when Mercer owned it, and Abe certainly knew him. He said, that's not, the, uh, that, that doesn't fly. And uh, they, had, they had Columbia and Decca and every other company pressing my LP to get it out yeah. real quick so that uh, we sold 300,000 wow. of the LPs in the first year. Mm -mm. So that really, then, of course, they picked up the contract, and I went on and did other mood right. albums, and and of course the company uh, they had an A&R man who used to be a trombonist, Andy Wiswell with Guy Lombardo's band. That was a big help to me. And uh, whenever the orchestra overshadowed the piano, fortunately my wife Franny was in the control booth and oh. let me know that. Uh -huh. And so we straightened that out. Yes. Anyway. Uh, then I did uh, Skylight Rhapsody and uh, the third LP of Mood albums with a 45, 50 piece band, mm -hmm. like the first one, uh, was a thing called A Fellow Needs a Girl. And the cover of that was uh, done by a good friend of ours, Dickie Avedon, the great photographer. Mm -hmm. It's the only album cover that he'd ever done or ever did since. Well. So that's a kick. Anyway, um, and then uh, trying to find all the standards that I had on the first LP got a little difficult. By the third LP, there were no more standards to look for. You know. I see. So you were like sc scraping for material. Yeah, yes. th it didn't make any sense. <laughs> and that's when I switched over to doing Night Sounds, Blue Angel. I get a kick out of Porter because I had Cole Porter's music mm -hmm. to work with. And the Irving Berlin album, that was... Uh, based on his 50th year as a composer. Yeah. And I used I Love a Piano as a theme song which he wrote in 1917, the year after I was born. Uh, and I got to know Irving. I did the Bell Telephone Hour when they did an Irving Berlin special. He was there and I was delighted to hang out with him. And uh, I went over and saw him. I only lived a couple of blocks 
from Beekman Place, where, uh, where Berlin lived. We were on Sutton. And I went over and had some coffee with him and to discuss it. And I thought of doing a 50th, because uh, you can get almost 30 minutes on an LP side. And even a ballad would not take more than a minute. That's why usually back in those days, the uh, single records always were two and a half minutes, mm -hmm. three minutes. And so I figured you could do 25 on each side. That would be his 50th anniversary. And the way to do it, obviously, which, uh, which Berlin came up with, uh, I was going to do a trail like an orchestral uh, overture, you know, mm -hmm. it got a little complicated in sketching it. And he said, why don't you just do it like a Tommy Dorsey arrangement, or Les Brown, or one of the swing bands, you know? Mm -hmm. He said, you could whistle that one out, you know, that, that, you, can, you can put that together. And so we did on that, uh, on the Berlin, uh, you know, album, it was Bushkin Spotlight's Berlin, they changed it to uh, Irving Berlin Piano Party or something on the uh, CD and right. something. Like but anyway, uh, we just did it like a medley, you know, yeah. a bunch of ballads and then an up-tempo thing. And it was all connected, and he got a big charge out of that. Great. He really did. In fact, he was like uh, Irving Berlin. You see, uh, all of the composers, Jimmy Van Hughes and Irving Berlin, Richard Rogers, uh, Cole Porter, I can go on and on with it, were all great song pluggers. And when you recorded their music, they loved you for nah, it. Yeah. Of course. He's not the guy that composed everything in one key, is he? Yeah, he composed everything on the black keys. Uh huh. I couldn't play on the black keys, but that's the way he played. He, pl he was self-taught, mm. and uh, he had it covered. He, oh, he was wonderful. Wow. Let me just ask you a couple, maybe a quick comment about some of the other a long, long list of people you've worked with. Uh, what kind of uh, boss was, was Tommy Dorsey? Oh, uh, Tommy was fine in this sense. If you could improvise, he'd never give you any heat. Like Don Lotus, Buddy Rich, Bunny Berrigan, myself, Siggy. Uh, he'd always uh, pick on the uh, good technical players, of which he was the best. Mm -hmm. Tommy was, had the most tremendous trombone technique uh -huh. and breathing and so forth. Sinatra always talks about him. Yes. Learned how to breathe, long phrases uh, based on Tommy Dorsey's method of doing it. But he was very difficult with any, uh, like a lead saxophone player, a lead trumpet player, and I remember one time when we were doing the uh, uh, Fame and Fortune program, and we were in New York playing, and I think we were at the Astro Roof, as a matter of fact, and we, we uh, went to NBC and recorded the Fame and Fortune show. And uh, the sponsor of the program was there, and uh, something happened with a, a DS. In musical terms, it's called del signa. Mm -hmm. It's the Italian phrase for go back to the sign. So when they have a del signa, which is a DS, a circle with a cross in it, a couple of dots, at a certain uh, bar line, say bar 102, and instead of writing a first and second, a first and second ending, because if you wanted that section repeated, you just mark, you put a DS sign where you wanted it to go back. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a couple of guys in the band didn't pay any attention to the DS sign. It sounded strange. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Tommy wanted to make good with the sponsor being there. And he, uh, he kind of, you know, had a little apple pie on his face. And uh, we had Steve Lipkins, who was a wonderful lead trumpet player with us along with Chuck Peterson and other guys. But um, he would pick on Steve, you know. And he said, Lipkins, and Steve never was um, dialogue free. You know, he came from a, 
His dad was an antitrust lawyer, was one of those very, very uh, high end, you know. Straight laced kind of guys. Yeah, very strict and so uh -huh. forth. And Steve had that built in. And uh, Steve stood up. And Tommy said, What does DS mean? And Steve said, Dorsey stinks. <laughs> That broke the band up, of course. We loved him for it. <laughs> Did he I keep... thought Tommy would get mad at him, but he thought it was very special. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Good. Oh, yeah. Tommy Good. was okay. Uh -huh. And Tommy loved playing jazz on the trumpet. And when I was with the band, uh, Bunny Bergen would actually toss his trumpet clear from the trumpet section over to the piano uh, during Losers Weepers when Tommy was playing some trumpet uh -huh. And then I would follow that. It was a blues and B flat. Oh, cool. And the guys in the band loved the idea that I would out improvise them every time. I you know? see. So yeah. he never gave me any heat. Yeah, great. How about Eddie Condon? Oh, I loved Eddie. He was a, Eddie was a barrel house. He was one of the guys in the band. You know? mm -hmm. The thing about Tommy Dorsey and Benny Goodman, Bunny Bergen especially, they were instrumentalists like we were. It wasn't like Paul Whiteman or someone up there with a fiddle under his arm who didn't yeah. play. You know. Uh huh. <laughs> right. And that makes a big difference. Uh -huh. They weren't just leaders, they, they were, were players too. They, they, they were players. That was very important to us. Yeah. What's the, your musical taste these days? What do you like to listen to? I don't really listen to very much music. I still listen to Louis Armstrong, a lot of his tapes. And I, I have a big problem with understanding the lyrics of uh -huh. a lot of the rock and roll people. And I like a lot of them. I get a kick out of the gospel sound. I really like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, at my age and four grown-up kids later and three grandchildren, uh, I'm kind of busy hanging with my Louis Armstrong. Right. Well, you can't go wrong with that, that's no, for sure. No, no way. I wrote a couple of things for the Benny Goodman band. Ernie Anderson, who was, uh, became entertainment director for Esquire, got Johnny DeVries and I to write a tune for the 1947 uh, year-end issue. And I wrote The Man Here Plays Fine Piano for that, and uh, Benny Goodman's band recorded it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget it, the name of the gal who was singing with us at the time, sang it. And I put that together. And then uh, there was a sponsor. On a, well, when I joined Benny's band, I was with the NBC orchestra with Bobby Hackett and a bunch of guys. And uh, Benny was in town, and I always wanted to play with Benny. I knew him from the time I was 12, 13 years old, actually, because I played in a, a high school band with his brother Irving, who was a good trumpet player. Oh. I got to know Harry Goodman was in my army band. I mean, I, I'm totally involved with that family. And uh, the sponsor was there with a very beautiful, as I recall, Danish wife. Well, it was a, a, a program called Concert Under the Stars. And Benny was just delighted about me being with the NBC band, because he didn't have to pay me for the program. NBC was paying me. That was a way to save a few bucks. <laughs> and I, was, uh, I wrote a couple of arrangements for him so I can pick up an extra 75 or a C note for each arrangement every week. And uh, I, was, uh, re I was rehearsing uh, Don't Play Me. I remember that tune, rehearsing him. And I wrote an intro like Bunny Bergen's I Can't Get Started for him and didn't realize that Benny didn't read guitar changes, you know, for the chord changes, to improvise on the changes. <laughs> well, uh, being with NBC and uh, doing the concert on the stars, that's when I joined Benny's band. When that program, uh, was over in New York. It was a summertime, apparently. Uh, and then uh, when we went to the West Coast, and this is something that bothered Benny a lot, it was called the Victor Borg program. For it was for Mobile Gas and and Ciccone. And the reason for it, no one knew who Victor Borg was, no. <laughs> but they knew who Benny Goodman's man was. Uh huh. But it turns out that the the sponsor was married to a very very beautiful Danish lady, and they came down to say hello to Benny. They wanted to meet him. And, he, you know, Benny, in his graceful manner, 
didn't bother introducing me. I was standing right there scribbling out his chord changes on his part. And uh, uh, the sponsor's wife said, I don't understand uh, if this program is called Concert Under the Stars in, um, in Denmark. At a park concert, they always start with a march. And that kind of confused Benny slightly. And he just turned around and said, Joe, bring a couple of marches in next week. You know, that's the end of that. And um, so I brought in, uh, you know, uh, Sousa's under the double eagle, boo, 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 doo, boo, 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 I did a jazz arrangement of that and a jazz arrangement of, uh, of a, a tune called Colonel Bogey, which later on became a big hit on the bridge of River yep. Kwai. Yep. And Benny in his stubborn manner, you know, if you say yes, he had to say no. There was no other way. Mm. He wouldn't record Colonel Bogey, and the guys in the band loved playing Colonel, Colonel Bogey because it swung more, you know, it had a better swing sound. Yeah. Anyway, Benny called, uh, under the double eagle that I did, he called Benji's Bubble, one of his daughter's names, and put his name on it and my name, so I got a little royally out of that. Yeah. Any case, that's the end of that right. story. Well, you know, you've had just... Uh the longest, uh, most productive career, and it's been a great pleasure talking to you okay, out here in you, Los Mark. Angeles. And so I appreciate your time and bringing these CDs for me to listen to back at the college. Sure. Well, well I most appreciate it. Right. I'm sure our students are getting a lot of them. Say hello to all the jazz fans at Hamilton. I will. Because <laughs> they were just the greatest. All right. And I ought to give, I've got the Joe Anderson's Vermont phone number. That's where he's living these yes, days. Yes, he is. And I've got his phone number. I've got to, to give him a call and yeah. tell him we were together doing In fact, I, I think I'll send him a copy of this video. When oh, you, he'd you'll love get to have too. it, I'm sure. Right. Okay, Mark, all, right. all, all the best. Thank you.